and kind of picking it up. Next stop, we have an eminent colorectal surgeon. So this is the samurai man. Uh, he uh, and and uh, so Dr. Lokman Maslan. Dr. Lokman Maslan is a consultant colorectal and general surgeon with Bantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur. And um, a lot of people need no introduction to Dr. Lokman, as as uh, Dr. Alex, of course. Uh, uh, Dr. Lokman is is uh, quite um, uh, a renowned uh, colorectal surgeon and uh, speaks quite a bit on colorectal cancer. This is really an area, I think, of close interest to, to his heart. Uh, actually, lower down, actually. Uh, to, uh, area of close interest to his colon, perhaps. And uh, what, is, what is also good is, and Dr. Lokman has got a special interest in another area, which is in nutrition. And he's going to touch on that a bit, I hope, today a little bit as well. Um, and uh, I'm very pleased to have Dr. Lokman with us this evening. Good evening, doctor. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Murali. Uh, thank you very much for having me here again. It's a, a pleasure. And I'd like to congratulate you on a great program. I like the way how you uh, you formulated as a multidisciplinary team. Um, and you've got two of my great colleagues with me here today. So, And me being placed right in the middle is generally what the flow of, uh, of the patient's experience will be. They usually will see uh, Alex first, and then they come and see me, and then... Uh, you know, they, they, they might end up seeing Dr. Mastura uh, after. So. Right, exactly, Doctor. And, and, and uh, I think one of the good things that I, all of y'all have kind of stressed over this, this past many, many sessions is that how cancer has really become a multidisciplinary uh, thing that needs to be approached by multiple doctors working together hand in hand to kind of address it as well. So Doctor, you, you are joining us this evening to speak about surgical management of colorectal cancer. And I think one yes. of the kind of emerging, emerging kind of notes from this entire series, a lot of feedback that we get is how people are really terrified of doing surgery, especially in colorectal cancer, because they're, they're kind of stuck with this thought that, oh no, it means I'm going to get a stoma and that's the end of me. Yes, I'm, so, I'm glad uh, you... Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly, doctor. So I'm hoping that you will help to kind of um, break through that myth, and I'm going to turn the screen right over to you to kind of uh, speak to us uh, about this. Thank you, Doctor. Right, thank you. So um, I'm just going to share my screen. Are you able to see this? Okay, so um, thank you very much once again, and I'm going to take it uh, from Alex to uh, to describe and discuss about the surgical management of colorectal cancer. So in, in many times uh, when patients are diagnosed with uh, colon cancer um, and the endoscopy is done either by Alex himself or, or by me, um, then, then the patients will be referred to me um, for uh, surgery, uh, unless you know, there are very exceptional cases where, where surgeries are not done. For example, if the patients are very weak or if the cancers are just too advanced. So um, my, my talk will be on that. And I will talk about the perspective of the patient, the, the patient's journey. But generally before that, um, I just like to, to divide uh, or, or, or shift the attention really to uh, the kinds of surgery that can be done uh, for uh, colorectal cancer. Um, so uh, the patient can either present as an emergency or the patient can present as in, in an elective setting, meaning the surgery is planned. Now, of course, uh, like what Dr. Alex says, there are many symptoms of colorectal cancer and patients who present with uh, uh, massive bleeding, okay, or they can present with uh, bowel obstruction uh, caused by the uh, cancer, or in very, uh, in a worst case scenario, then what can happen is that, um, the, the pressure builds up to a point where there is a hole in the bowel and then you might get a bowel perforation. So these obviously would require emergency surgeries. And um, I, I will not uh, touch on that too much because when I describe about, um, about how we manage uh, uh, colon cancers uh, through surgery, um, that will also be uh, described. So I will probably talk more of um, the patient's journey in an elective setting. So how it begins is usually the patient will come to see the surgeon in the clinic and then he'll be admitted. He'll go undergo surgery. He'll go back to the ward and then 
after his discharge, he will come and see me back in the clinic, right? So in the clinic, um, the patient will undergo a, um, uh, an interview in a way or a, an assessment by me. And one of the main things that I will first look at is um, his symptoms. And then I will look at his colonoscopy. Um, to, the main aim of this is to locate exactly where the tumor is. Because uh, depending on the location of the tumor, it would determine the kind of surgery that would be done. And I will show more of that later. So once, the, once we know the location of the tumor, then the next question would be, what is the stage of this tumor? And in that case, most of the time, the patients will already have come to me with a CT scan or in the case of rectal cancer, um, together with an MRI. If this is not done, then I will uh, organize this. So I need all this information to, um, to help me decide what would be the best uh, kind of surgery for this patient. Now, since we're talking about stages of uh, colorectal cancer, um, this is just a short video that basically shows that like what Dr. Alex says, it all starts with a small growth called a polyp. And with time, if this polyp gets bigger and then it gets bigger, um, it can invade through the wall of the colon. And if it does that, then it becomes stage two, right? Now we know that there are lymph nodes that follow the blood supply to the colon. And if these lymph nodes are, are, uh, are affected, then, um, then uh, they are come stage three. And unfortunately, if it goes to the liver or the lung, then it would be uh, stage four, right? So those are the stages of colorectal cancer. And Dr. Mastura will obviously talk about uh, the treatment of that, especially with stage three and stage four. Now, one of the things that uh, is done in the clinic is I will review, as I said, all these tests, and then I will take a, a consent for surgery after describing the details of the surgery. And then I will set um, you know, the date and time of surgery depending on how urgent it is or not. I will get the admission documents ready and I will advise the patient on uh, what to prepare and the diet and the nutrition. Now, um, with regard to diet and nutrition, I, I didn't have specific slides on this, but all I like to say is that surgical, uh, surgery is, is, uh, is, is, um, gives a very high amount of stress to the body. It's like asking a person to run in a way for a marathon. And if you can imagine a cancer patient who's weak because of the cancer, he hasn't been eating well, he's been losing weight. And if he doesn't eat well prior to surgery, which gives so much stress, then uh, you expect poor outcome. So if you ask a marathon runner to not eat for the past one week, he has lost weight, you ask him to run, he will, he will collapse. So similarly, if the patient is not uh, adequately nourished, then after surgery, um, you expect complications to occur, all right? Now, um, the most important part obviously is on, on this talk and I will also discuss with the patient in the clinic is about the surgery itself, the technical uh, aspects of it. Now, uh, as Dr. Alex has shown, this is the colon. The colon is the large uh, bowel, right? Now, if you look at it, um, uh, the colon stretches all the way from the appendix on the, on the right, and then it, it goes all the way up to the, uh, to the rectum. Now, for surgeons and for, for, doctor, you know, for people who treat colorectal cancer, we separate the colon and the rectum. They're, they're like two different organs. So the, so the rectum is basically towards the end of the, of the, uh, of the colon. Uh, and the, 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 the difficulty about treating the rectum is that it is enclosed within the, the pelvis or the hip bone. Right, and it, especially in a male where the pelvis is not big, because in a female the, the pelvis is bigger to to accommodate uh, delivery of, of a child. Um, in a male pelvis, it's really very narrow, so the challenge is performing surgeries there. So this is just a picture of how um, the colon uh, has been removed, and this is uh, one of the patients I did where we removed the whole colon. Right, so as what Dr. Alex said, most of the tumors are on the left side, which probably would include the rectum. So this is a sorry. These are pictures of of uh, of what um, of uh, what the uh, tumor of the rectum or the colon would look like. You can imagine I have cut open the colon and I've showed you what the tumor actually looks like. And this kind of uh, tumors can cause bleeding. They can cause blockage. All right. And this is a different kind because you can see this narrowing right in the middle of the bowel. And that and this patient presented with uh, intestinal obstruction.
Right. Now, after the, the patient has seen me in the clinic, I have arranged the date for surgery. The patient gets admitted to the ward on the day. Usually, what uh, the patient is admitted the day before, uh, most of the time. And in which case, then a nurse will come and see, the eye will come and see, the anesthetist will come and see. So as I said, it's a really a multidisciplinary team management. We will do some blood tests to check the heart. You know, we will, sometimes it's required to even clean the bowel because even though I'm a colorectal surgeon, I don't really like to see uh, stools or, or, or feces. So I like to clean the bowels before I do surgery. Uh, and then the patient will, will be fasted for about four to six hours before surgery. Right. So the, on the day of the surgery, the patient will be wheeled in into the surgery and the surgery will be done under general anesthesia. The surgery will take about two to four hours, sometimes a little bit more. And again, it's a really a team effort of surgeons, anesthetists, my assistants, nurses, and there'll probably be about five to eight people sometimes in the, in the, um, in the uh, operating room. And the patient is all the time uh, unconscious and you know you probably won't be aware until it's all over. So the general concepts in, uh, in colorectal cancer surgery is basically that um, you have these lymph nodes, these things in green here that actually follow the blood supply. And when we do operations on the bowel, we just cannot remove the bowel alone. You have to remove the bowel and the lymph nodes together with the blood supply. Because if you leave these lymph nodes behind and cancer has entered these lymph nodes, then, uh, then you run the risk of uh, the cancer coming back and that's what you don't want. So when we do a surgery uh, on the right side and we remove the right side of the colon, that surgery is called a right hemicolectomy. Uh, if we remove uh, part on the left side, that's called a left hemicolectomy. And if you remove part of the uh, rectum or you know, the sigmoid colon, then that would be called an anterior resection, right? Now, the next question is, let's take, for example, left hemicolectomy. When we remove the bowel, right? Let's say we remove it, then you have really two ends. And what do you do with these two ends? Well, unless it's really, really an emergency and you can't join the bowel, and I'll talk about stoma later, most of the time we join the bowels back. And how we join the bowels back is either we, we stitch it back or we use a special device called a stapler. Now it's not a usual paper stapler that we use for paper. These are uh, specially designed equipment is used to join uh, our bowels back. Okay, so we use um, a stapler to join. Now, what about the rectum? The rectum is a little bit different than the colon. If you can imagine, as, as I said, in the male pelvis is very small. The size of the rectum is like the Coca-Cola can. Okay? And if you can imagine, if you have a tumor within a Coca-Cola can, how do you remove the tumor? You can't just remove the tumor leaving the rectum behind. You've got to remove the rectum together. And that is really the challenge and the technical difficulties in doing such a surgery. And in fact, um, what was, um, yeah, so you just can't remove that. So, and as I said, you can't remove the rectum on its own. You have to remove the, um, no, the, the fat surrounding it because the fat surrounding it contains the lymph nodes. Okay, so what was discovered, and it's only really about in the 1980s that we discovered this, because before that, surgeons were just removing the rectum without removing the fat around it. And what, it, when what occurred was that these patients, we found 60 to 70% of them would have the cancer coming back. So we found that we got to remove the fat around it because the fat around it contains the lymph nodes, right? And it was really this guy, um, uh, Bill Hill in 1982, that, that uh, revolutionized rectal cancer surgery. So what he did was that he described, and I was very fortunate to meet him, um, to actually remove the, the rectum together with the fat and the lymph nodes surrounding it. And what he found was that he managed to reduce the recurrence rates from you know, 60, 70% to less than 10%. And these patients lived uh, longer and longer. So then again, similarly to the colon, when you have two ends, what do you do with them? We normally join them back. So when we join the colon back, we, it's very difficult to stitch inside the rectum because it's a very narrow area, as I said. So we have this gun-like material Oh, sorry, this gun-like uh, tool, it's also called a stapler, where it comes from the anus and we insert it from below, it goes up, and you can see here that the bowels are, are joined. So this is how we join our bowels, the rectum back. Now, when it comes to surgery, I'm sure many of you have heard open versus keyhole or laparoscopic, and there's also now robotic. So we talk about open surgery, it basically means a cut through the abdomen, right through the belly button. 
right? And this is what you see. It's, uh, it's a messy surgery, but this is what we all are trained with. But nowadays, um, I, by default, try to give the patient um, uh, keyhole surgery or laparoscopic surgery because uh, it's, 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 um, it's less painful. Inside, this, it's the same. So we remove, uh, I mean, inside it's the same in terms of the concept that I just showed. We remove the bowel together with the lymph node. So it's basically inside it's the same, but with smaller wounds, okay, with smaller wounds, uh, even though you might see many uh, little wounds here, but trust me, the pain is much less. Patients recover faster and they, 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 they go home faster. And in terms of cancer removal, it's really the same. So this is why it looks inside. And if you compare or to the open wound, you can see that you know, there's, there's a marked difference and patients who have small keyhole uh, wounds, um, usually by three to six months, you probably won't even notice that there's much of a wound there. Now, unless there's really, really, really small tumors, then you can do local resections and uh, especially in the rectum. So these are uh, specially designed instruments that we use. And I, I, this is me performing a surgery through the anus, um, removing a very small rectal tumor. So these kind of patients, if you're fortunate to, uh, I mean, if you're un unfortunate to get cancer, but you're fortunate that the cancers are small enough, then you can actually uh, do the surgery in this way. Of course, as I said, because the male pelvis is so small, sometimes you have a big tumor, it's very difficult to operate. Though nowadays we have the robot. So what the robot does is not the robot himself do the surgery, the surgeon controls the robot. Okay, and you can see here that, um, you can see here on the, on the left, Sorry, on the left is that the, uh, uh, the, the, the operation is being done. And here, nowadays, we can have single ports and you have this robotic, this uh, alien-like uh, equipment that can do the surgery with just one hole. So that would be the future. Okay, and um, these are all, all the new uh, instruments that are used to, to perform uh, these surgeries. And of course, uh, you know, you have industries like Google and Johnson & Johnson joining up and creating new and newer robots. So that's gonna be an exciting field of surgery for the next 10 to 20 years. Now, you cannot escape talking about stomas when you're talking about surgical management of cancers. Um, so when you talk about stomas, it, there are two kinds of stomas. They're either permanent or they're temporary. And in permanent stomas, it usually involves cancers that are involving the anal sphincter. The anal sphincters are muscles that control your anus. And if the tumor touches that, you cannot save the sphincter. You save the sphincter because the patient doesn't want a stoma, the cancer is left behind, the cancer comes back. It's not good, right? So in, this, in such a case, if you remove the, the rectum, then what happens to, to this end of the colon, then it brought, it's being brought up as a stoma and the patient, the patient has a permanent stoma. However, there are times when the stoma can be temporary. For example, when we join the rectum back, and in such a case where the tumor does not involve the, the muscle that control the anus, then we can create a little stoma that basically diverts the stool away from the joint so that the joint can heal well and that the patient can, uh, and maybe down, maybe three to six months after the first surgery, you can reverse the stoma and hopefully then the patient will be able to pass motion uh, almost like normal. So really having a stoma is not really the end of the world. I have had a friend who was a 40 year old doctor when he had cancer, uh, he had his anus removed, he had a stoma. And um, right now he's climbing mountains, he's swimming. So it's really not the end of the world. Obviously it's not a good thing to have, but it's something that, that if there is a chance for a cure, uh, I'm sure many patients will, uh, wouldn't mind uh, having it. Okay, so having said that, there's really no place for these guys. Because I have seen patients, when you talk about stoma, they're so scared, they run away. Okay? And then uh, they run away, they come back six months later, they see these guys, and really, um, then by then the tumor, it's a bit too late to, to do much. Now, after the surgery, the patient goes back to the ward, all right? And um, recovery depends. Uh, we'll usually give some painkillers, some antibiotics. You get a physiotherapy to come and help move you, help you breathe. And then when it comes to feeding, usually immediately after surgery, we don't give food immediately. Patients generally get fluids and then slowly are introduced to soft food. Eventually, by the time they go home after a week, then they can eat like normal, right? And if they have a stoma, they're taught how to care for it. Now, as I said, if, if surgery is keyhole, usually recovery is faster. I have patients going back within three to five days. And if they are 
um, undergoing the big open surgery, then usually it's a bit later. Now, what is the risk of this surgery? And it's always good to tell the patients the risk because a lot of times the, you know, people paint a very rosy picture of things, but there's always a risk. Every surgery, there's a risk. So it's, a, it's the role of the surgeon to tell the patient. So the worst thing that can happen is that there is a leak. And a leak means that where you join, okay, the, there is stool coming out and that stool into the abdomen is not good. So the risk of leak is there, but it's actually quite relatively small. So it's about five to 8%. The patient has to be aware that for every 100 patients that you operate, about five patients might, might leak. Okay, there are other less, so another complication that can happen is a wound infection. So if the patient is malnourished, there's not much protein, the patient hasn't been eating very well, you do a big surgery, especially if it's a big cut, there's a high risk of a wound infection. In this picture, for example, the wound breaks down, the bowel pops out. It's a messy thing, you try to avoid that. Of course, there are other uh, complications like lung infections, urine infections, and if patients don't move, because we always encourage patients to move, uh, as fast as possible. So, but if they don't move, then they run a risk of having a deep vein thrombosis and uh, that, then, you know, that, that can re lead to disastrous complications. Now, after the patient goes home, um, he will normally come to see me after two weeks. I'll check his wound, I'll examine him. If he has a stoma, I will see how he's managing the stoma, does he have any problems. But one, one of the most important things that I will do is actually review the results of the tumor that I've removed because I need to know what stage exactly is it. I'd like to see whether the lymph nodes are involved or not, because if the lymph nodes are involved, then it's a stage three. And in these cases, especially, then these cases are referred to Dr. Mastura or, or to another oncologist for uh, further treatment, right? So these patients are generally seen every three months for the next five years or so, or well, two to three to five years. I will, um, every time they come to see me, we've got to check for the tumor marker called the CEA. We've got to do yearly colonoscopies and yearly CT scans just to make sure that this thing doesn't come back. Now, like I said, when managing patients, it's never a decision of one person. Nowadays, it's always really a team effort and the patient can be rest assured that whatever decision is made, especially in, you know, in, in, in hospital like ours, Pantai Hospital, where we really have a good team, it's always um, a, a joint effort between many uh, professionals. So what is the take home message I'd like to take here? Number one, unless it's an emergency, surgery always requires expensive planning, all right? So we try to avoid an emergency. It's very important for you to detect these cancers early. And the type of surgery depends on the location of the cancers, which, which I have shown earlier. And the, really the general concept of removing cancers is that you've got to remove the bowel together with the lymph nodes. And you've got to remove it all in one piece, okay? And having a stoma is a possibility. Um, and it should not be taught as the end of the world. If you can be cured because, if you can be cured uh, and it would result in a stoma, then I think it is worth it, okay? And colorectal cancer management requires really a multidisciplinary approach. So, right, that's all. Thank you very much. And um, I'm uh, very glad to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, doctor. Uh, and I think uh, lovely that you actually took us through the entire patient kind of um, experience and the possibilities and all the different avenues that they have as well. But just, I think about a couple of questions, if you are a little okay for time, are you okay, doctor? Yeah, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. I'm a little bit, okay, lovely, lovely. The, the, there's one question from a viewer and, and this person asks is, what is the largest, what is the, I, I don't know, largest, biggest thing that I need to be worried about if I'm going for surgery in terms of colorectal cancer? Okay, well, I think, there are two things that um, the, the patient has to be aware of. And this is what I always tell the patient. Number one, we want to remove the cancer. But number two, we always want to make sure that at the end of the day, safety is very important. It's the, probably the most important. There's no use that I remove the cancer and you become more sick or you might die. Okay, then, then you know, sometimes, then in that case, sometimes it's better not to do anything. So the greatest uh, risk of, this surgery is basically number one, the, the, the immediate risk is obviously a leak, okay? Because especially when you join the bowel. So sometimes, as I said, when, we, when the surgeon thinks that it's not safe, uh, when he joins the bowel, then he would create a temporary bag or stoma so that the stool doesn't disturb that place. The other thing that I would probably be scared, but that's probably more the long-term is recurrent. So what you do need to do is um, 
you need a, a, a good team, you need a good surgeon who, who, who does this thing regularly because if somebody does cancer surgery once a month or once every two months, then that it's really, it's, um, you know, it, uh, it's different than a person doing it, uh, you know, two or three cancers a week. So obviously um, the risk is that, and studies have actually shown that somebody that, who does it often enough actually uh, results in these cancers coming back less as opposed to somebody who does it very infrequently um, because of, uh, you know, you might be leaving cancer behind. So I think that is the, probably the greatest fear, leaving cancer behind. Um, that would be the, the, the greatest risk. Yeah, yeah. Well, the doctor. There's, there's also another question on when, um, and, and it's, it's a bit convoluted, I'm trying to rephrase this, on uh, when uh, do you decide not to have surgery on colorectal cancer? Okay. So as I said, um, there is a patient factor and there's a cancer factor. Okay. Now, the patient factor is that if the patient is just uh, too ill, Okay, you might have a patient who is bedridden, who has stroke, and whose quality of life is, is just not, it's, it's just too bad. And even if he has cancer, which is curable, then sometimes you need to discuss with the family, is this the best thing to do? Because he might not survive the surgery, right? So that would be the, the patient factor. Now, the other thing is the, is, the, is the tumor factor. Now, the tumor factor is when... Um, if the patient has very little symptoms, but the, the tumor has spread everywhere, unfortunately, there are patients like that who they have liver cancer, the, the tumor has gone to the liver, has gone to the lungs, right? And, but the patient has no problem. He, he can pass motion, there's no bleeding. Then performing the surgery would delay the control of the, uh, of the tumors in the lung and the liver. And these patients would probably they might need surgery at some point, but they would probably go towards to see Dr. Mastura for oncology treatment first. Get the chemotherapy or, or radiotherapy for that matter to control the uh, liver and lung first. Then maybe if he survives it, then um, we can remove the primary cancer. So there are uh, very, well, they're not common, but, but there are times when, when we don't do anything. At the end of the day, patient comes first. It's not about the surgeon. The surgeon likes to cut. Sometimes we have to remind ourselves that look, what is best for the patient. This is not the, this is not the best thing to do. We shouldn't operate. Yeah, right. Uh, thank you, doctor. I'm going to steal one question uh, from the uh, I mean, into the time going to injury time a little bit, and ask yep. you a little bit about how important nutrition is in like uh, management of of colorectal cancer for a patient. Because you mentioned just now that when you have very poor nutrition. Uh, that actually yeah. plays a, quite a big role in recovery. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, sorry about, um, I, I didn't, because it, in the interest of time, I, I, I couldn't squeeze everything in. Right. But, <laughs> but, but when it comes to nutrition, um, a lot of patients who are diagnosed with cancer have to a certain amount, have a certain amount of uh, uh, malnourishment. And when they come to see me in the clinic, uh, I mean, it's an emergency, I can't help much. But if, it's, if they come to see me in the clinic, we can plan. Now, sometimes it's worth to delay the surgery up to two weeks. Okay, now because, and then in such a case, I will prescribe the patient some, some supplements. Well, I wouldn't say it's supplements. I would probably say it's, a, it's a, what we call a nutritional support, oral nutritional support. So there are many brands, for example, they are uh, Ensure or they could be Glucina or they could be, you know, Nutrients. All the different, different brands are out there. And I would tell the patient, take this, take this uh, powder, powdered milk most of the time. Take this powdered milk as if you're taking antibiotics. Take it twice a day for the next two weeks because this, this, uh, these powders, they actually contain very high amount of protein. Okay, and this protein is needed for wound healing to fight infection. So by the time you come for surgery, you actually at least uh, top up that, 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 that protein reserve. So you undergo the surgery and then after the surgery, once you're allowed to eat, you have to continue this, uh, this product for at least another month. Because even after you go home, I know you're eating well, but you probably would still need this extra push to make, um, you know, to, to improve your outcome. Uh, because if you don't do that, then uh, you have a higher chance of wood infection. You have a higher chance of uh, bowel leakage. And uh, the patients, and, you know, studies have shown that patients have a higher chance of dying if they are too, too weak for surgery. Yeah. Right. So um, thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor, once again. And I think a very 
kind of relevant and insightful points. I, you did share with us a little bit of a take home. One message, if uh, you could. Uh, uh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. There's a question, if, if you're okay to take it. Yes, That's sure. The last question. Okay, oh, this one is super complicated. Like, okay, uh, with, the sigmoid colon, with the sigmoid colon cancer and malignant infiltration into the omentum, can three, the three-hole surgery be used instead of opening a hole in the entire stomach? Oh, I mean, okay, that's a good question. Um, okay. Actually, um, uh, you can do keyhole surgery in almost any situation unless the tumor has invaded into another organ, like, for example, uh, the bladder, or has involved into um, some small intestines, sometimes it's technically difficult. If it's just the omentum, you still can remove the omentum together with the tumor. That's not a problem. Omentum is just loose fat. That's okay. But, you know, if, if it's so big that it invades into bone and into... In, in a, when I was in Australia, they, they, they do really big surgeries where tumors of the rectum invade into the bone, into the prostate, into the bladder, and patients undergo these huge surgeries. Um, and, you know, because it's a very big center, they have good success rate. So, but they don't do it keyhole. They always do it in open surgery. So as a laparoscopic surgeon, I always have to know my limitations. If I can't do it, I will tell the patient, look, we can't do it keyhole, just got to do it open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, got it, doctor. Thank you so much. Thank Ladies you. And gentlemen, we, we were with uh, Dr. Lokman Maslan today. He's a consultant colorectal and general surgeon at Pantai Hospital, Icro. And some of the good things that I think Dr. Uh, Lokman <laughs> managed to kind of share. There's one more. Uh, sorry, Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Oh my God, sorry. There's so many Pantais. We've been doing quite a few Pantais. Okay, Pantai Hospital Kuala Lumpur. Kuala Lumpur. And, uh, and uh, what, what I think among the good things that Dr. kind of highlighted today is the entire patient experience within the colorectal cancer journey and uh, the importance of, of uh, surgery in that process. What are the things that you can do and, and you should be doing and especially don't be afraid of facing surgery for rectal cancer that seems to be still one of the best things that you can do in managing your cancer. So thank you very much, doctor. Very good evening to you and we hope to see you thank soon. You. And thank you very to much. see you in KL, Kuala Lumpur, Bukan Aikro. Terima kasih. Okay, thank you, doctor. Good evening.